okay baby seal this is my christmas baby seal and i'm with you today to discuss how does the codependent sees you her intimate partner this is the third in a series of three videos the first one is how does the narcissist see you the second one is how does the borderline see you and <laughs> now how does the codependent see you it's reminiscent of the world series only much more thrilling and much less predictable. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and I'm also a professor of psychology in CIAPS, Center for International Advanced Professional Studies, the outreach program of the CIAPS Consortium of Universities. Yep, this over we can go straight into the codependent's mind. The codependent says to her intimate partner, I need you. I depend on you. I won't survive without you. I'm afraid that you will dump me. And her insistence in repeating these sentences borders on brainwashing or indoctrination. She leverages learned helplessness into an art form. It is the equivalent of emotional blackmail. The codependent says, I can't make sense of the world without you. I need you to make decisions for me. I want you to rescue and protect me, especially from myself. I'm so, I'm so unsure of who I am and what is the best course of action, that you had become my lodestone. Her clinginess and neediness are couched in words of wisdom. She says, I have so much ambition, so much energy and imagination, and a lot of insight, but I lack self-confidence and it's holding me back. I don't trust my own abilities and judgment, and that is where you, my intimate partner, comes in as my alter ego, as my uh, facilitator. Tell me, she says, just keep telling me that you love me. Tell me this all the time, unsolicited. I need you to tell me this. I need you to reassure me because it feels so wonderful to love you. It feels so magnificent to be needed and wanted finally by someone. You're the only person in the world who cares about me and loves me and it makes me, makes me feel alive again. Without you, I'm numb. Without you, I'm dead. So I want to become one with you. I want to merge with you. I want to fuse with you. I want us to be inseparable because I love myself through you. I demand that you give me what I need because I always give you what you need and I do it unquestioningly. I do it unhesitatingly. I, I submit to your every whim and wish. I never disagree with you. I never criticize you. Doesn't this call for reciprocity? Don't I deserve something for putting up with you, essentially? I love you. Don't ever leave me. Take me everywhere with you. I wish I could fit into your pocket. We will do everything together always. And I will be your child and you will keep me safe. I call this in-house talking, by the way. And the codependent continues her solilo soliloquy. She says, never mind what you do to me. I will always be here by your side. I will always have your back. I will save you. I will have pity on you when no one else will, and I'll redeem you. I feel guilty and responsible for your abuse, and because sometimes I'm considering to abandon you, but I never, I never will, rest assured. It's only me saying stupid things. Don't pay attention. I cannot live apart from you. I cannot have a life without you anymore. I wish I could overcome you. I wish I could erase you, but this will never happen. This is the codependence um, 
voice. This is how she sees uh, her intimate partner. I wrote in the Open Sight Encyclopedia the entry about codependent personality disorder, and I said there, the codependent dependent molds herself or himself, yes, molds herself and bends over backward to cater to the needs of her nearest and dearest and to satisfy their every whim, wish, expectation and demand. Nothing is too unpleasant or too unacceptable if it serves to secure the uninterrupted presence of the codependent's family and friends and the emotional sustenance that she can extract or extort from them. Codependent does not feel fully alive when she is alone. She feels helpless, threatened, ill at ease and childlike. This acute discomfort drives the codependent to hop from one relationship to another. The sources of nurturance are interchangeable. To the codependent, being with someone, with anyone, no matter who, is always preferable to agonizing solitude. There are several types of codependence. Codependency is a complex, multifaceted and multidimensional defense against the codependent's fears and needs. There are five categories of codependency stemming from the respective etiologies. Number one, codependency that aims to fend off anxieties related to abandonment. These codependents are clingy, smothering and prone to panic. They are plagued with ideas of reference, referential ideation. They display self-negating submissiveness. The main concern of these type of codependents is to prevent their victims, friends, spouses, family members, from deserting them or from attaining true autonomy and independence. These codependents merged with their loved ones and experience any sign of abandonment, actual, threatened, anticipated, or even imagined, as a form of self-annihilation or amputation. In this, the codependent is very similar to the borderline, resembles her. <coughs> the second type of codependency is geared to cope with the codependent's fear of losing control. By feigning helplessness and neediness, such codependents coerce their environment into ceaselessly catering to their needs, wishes, and requirements. This is control from the bottom. These codependents are labile drama queens, and their life is a kaleidoscope of instability and chaos. These codependents refuse to grow up. They force their nearest and dearest to treat them as emotional or as physical invalids. They deploy their self-imputed deficiencies and disabilities as weapons. They wield them as weapons. But these types of codependents use emotional blackmail. And when necessary, they uh, threaten to secure the presence and blind compliance of their suppliers one way or another. Both types, by the way. The first type and the second type do this. Then there's the third type. The vicarious codependent. Vicarious codependents live through others, like the moon with the sun, reflected light. Vicarious codependents sacrifice themselves in order to glory in the accomplishments of their chosen targets. They subsist on reflected light, on secondhand applause, and on derivative achievements. They have no personal history, having suspended their own lives, wishes, preferences, and dreams in favor of someone else's. One type of such vicarious codependent is the inverted narcissist. I'm quoting from my book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, 10th edition. The inverted narcissist. A subtype of covert narcissist. This is a codependent who depends exclusively on narcissists. A narcissist codependent. If you're living with a narcissist, if you have a relationship with one, if you are married to one, if you are working with a narcissist, it does not mean that you are an inverted narcissist. To qualify as an inverted narcissist, you must crave to be in a relationship with a narcissist, regardless of any abuse inflicted on you by him or her. You must actively seek relationships with narcissists, and only with narcissists, no matter what your bitter and traumatic past experience has been. 
you must feel empty and unhappy in relationships with any other kind of person except the narcissist. Only then, and if you satisfy the other diagnostic criteria of dependent personality disorder, can you be safely labeled an inverted narcissist. The fourth type of codependent is the borderline codependent or borderline narcissist. These codependents oscillate between periods of clinging and other codependent behavior patterns, which they interpret as intimacy, and periods of aloofness, detachment, and emotional neglect and abandonment, which they regard as legitimate and the only possible manifestations of their personal autonomy and space. Codependent or borderline narcissists also tend to form with their intimate partner a shared fantasy, a shared psychosis, for les deux. These are all the outcomes of their overwhelming and all-pervasive abandonment anxiety. They either smother their partner in an attempt to forestall abandonment, or they preemptively abandon sheep, thus avoiding hurt and maintaining an illusion of control over the situation. I walked out on her and I dumped her, not the other way around. The codependent deploys strategies such as merger, becoming one with her intimate partner, while renouncing all personal autonomy and independence of both of them, up to the point of a shared fantasy. So this is one strategy deployed by codependents. There is another strategy known as coextensivity. The I call it the ventriloquist, the ventriloquist defense, insisting that the partner mind reads her and acts in ways that reflect her inner psychological states and moods, which are not communicated. Then there is shifting boundaries, using behavioral unpredictability and ambient uncertainty to induce paralyzing dependence in the partner. And finally, the fifth type of codependent is another form of dependence that is so subtle that it eludes det it eluded detection until very recently. So the fifth type of codependent is known as counter-dependent. Counter-dependents reject and despise authority. They are contumacious, and they often clash with authority figures, such as parents, bosses, the law. Their sense of self-worth and their very self-identity are premised on, and they are derived from, um, this autonomy. In other words, they are dependent on these acts of bravura and defiance. They are personal autonomy militants. Counterdependents are fiercely, uncompromisingly independent on the surface. They are controlling, they are self centered, they are aggressive, but actually they are highly dependent on these displays of reactance. Many of them are antisocial and use projective identification. They force people to behave in ways that buttress and affirm the counterdependent's view of the world and his expectations. And these behavior patterns are often the result of deep-seated fear of intimacy. In an intimate relationship, counterdependents feel enslaved, ensnared, captive, shackled. Counterdependents are locked into approach avoidance repetition compulsion cycles. Hesitant approach is followed by avoidance commitment. Avoidance of commitment. They are Counterdependents are lone wolves and bad team players, but highly dependent on reacting to other people. Counterdependence is a reaction formation. A counterdependent dreads his own weaknesses. He seeks to overcome them by projecting an image of omnipotence, omniscience, success, self sufficiency, and superiority. It's very similar to narcissism. Most classical overt narcissists are actually counterdependents. Their emotions and needs are buried under scar tissue, which had formed, coalesced, and hardened during years of one form of abuse or another. Grandiosity, a sense of entitlement, a lack of empathy, and overwinning haughtiness usually hide knowing insecurity and a fluctuating sense of self-worth. There may be a sixth form of codependency, and I call it situational or late-onset codependency. Some people develop codependent behaviors and traits in the wake of a life crisis or trauma, especially a traumatic relationship, especially if it involves an abandonment and the resulting solitude, a divorce, an empty nest. Such late 
onset codependency fosters a complex emotional and behavioral chain reaction whose role is to resolve the inner conflict by ridding oneself of the emergent, undesirable, codependent conduct. Consciously, such a, part, such a patient may at first feel liberated, but unconsciously, being abruptly dumped and lonesome is a disorienting and disconcerting effect. I have dedicated a whole video to situational codependency and late onset codependency. I recommend that you watch it. Thank you for listening and Happy New Year. Tomorrow, a video about the best New Year resolution you can ever make. Get rid of a fake friend.